people in. Okay, thank you. Um, mm. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to have you all here. Uh, my name is Tom Murray. I'm a Director for Professional Development for Student Success and Retention Innovation. Um, and this is part of our summer workshop series. Um, we wanted to um, tap into the expertise that we have here on campus um, amongst our colleagues to do some professional development over the summer. And I'm really excited to be joined by Kelly Amser, uh, who is a senior, senior learning specialist, right, Kelly? Yes, senior learning specialist for CATS Academics. Um, and she is here to um, talk about facilitating meetings. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to her and uh, mute myself, um, but the chat box should be open. If you have any problems uh, during the meeting, feel free to private message me. Um, and otherwise, uh, take it away, Kelly. Thanks, Tom. It's great to see everybody here. Good afternoon. Um, the presentation is part of the SSRI workshop series, and this session is called Under the Hood, How to Be a Successful Facilitator. Uh, my name is Kessler, and like Tom said, I'm a Senior Lead Learning Specialist with CAS Academic. Pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am glad to have all of us here today. Um, quick note, I have been having a little bit of trouble with my internet, so Tom, if you could do me the favor and just let me know if you become unstable internet-wise in any way, and, um, and what's worked for me is I just shut my video off, um, but you can still see the presentation and still hear me. So what you'll see in this presentation, if Tom, you're the one that's doing all of the slides for me, so if you can go ahead and move forward. Um, we are going to be talking about under the hood, how to be a successful facilitator. And I will be modeling a lot of these behaviors and we'll also be talking about them. So under the hood is really important because it's everything that we do to create a successful meeting uh, that we can't see. And so those are the things we're going to be talking about today. And why is it important to be a successful facilitator? Uh, you are a powerful person. You are providing an environment for discussion. You are giving value to everyone and letting their voice be heard. And you are integral to moving the mission forward. So meetings are established because there is some sort of task or action to be happening. And uh, you as the facilitator get to be a part in that. So moving on to the next slide, which is our purpose for today. And that is our goal for the meeting. And so I sent out an agenda before the meeting and that was the main thing that I wanted to make clear is that uh, we all knew the title of this presentation and we had a brief summary. So hopefully you're all in the right place and you're here for the right reason. And I want to establish uh, the reason for this meeting is to empower you with strategies and resources to be prepared, confident and adaptable as a facilitator. So uh, in framing this conversation, it's important to know that this is not a brainstorming session or an open-ended workshop. Uh, I really want us to have great conversation, uh, but we did all agree to this workshop with a common goal. And so it is my role as the facilitator to make sure that that is achieved. So uh, for something for you all to know as facilitators before we get to our icebreaker tops, <laughs> uh, for you all to know as facilitators is, um, ahead of, or at least at the start of meetings, if they're recurring, to state your purpose, what you hope to achieve, so that everyone can approach the meeting with the same mindset, uh, so that people, if people get off track, you have something to bring them back to, and we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. One more thing before we move forward um, is that based on the feedback that I received from participants in this meeting, the focus of the, of the facilitator strategies is going to be geared towards mid-sized groups, so somewhere between five and 15 people, 
uh, a lot of it intra-departmentally. People really talked about um, their need to talk within their staff. Um, but a lot of this can be can be crossed with other sizes and other types of groups. So if something that I share about today does not translate, uh, please feel free to uh, ask a question. I will make sure to make space for that in the meeting today, um, or you can reach out to me directly. All right, so now we can move on to our icebreaker. Um, Tom was the wise one who shared and demonstrated with me that uh, engagement in meetings, which is something that some of you had asked about, is prompted by everyone hearing their own voice, which is especially powerful for setting the tone at the beginning of meetings. So looking at this question here, um, and since a lot of us have been spending a lot of time on screens and a lot of time communicating over technology, um, and the most used or addicting or loved app for you uh, since March. I didn't wanna say quarantine because we've all kind of been probably on different timelines for that. So since March, when we all went to working from home, uh, what has been the one that has uh, stuck with you the most? And um, all I'm gonna do is just go through and, and go down my list here because I would love to hear from everybody. And uh, let's see, and, and feel free also to post something in the chat. I think that's awesome. If I get to you and you don't have one, you can say pass, you can put it in the chat later. But yeah, I totally see Instagram on there, absolutely. If I had an Instagram, that would probably be my addicting app. Um, mine has been Spotify. I have really used Spotify to help me like set different moods throughout the day, get me uh, into different head spaces, and that has been, that has been key for me. So, um, I'm gonna go to uh, Max first because I, I know he's got something good and, and I'll keep going through my list. I'd love to hear from everybody. So Max, we'll start with you. Um, I would say my most used would have to be probably between Twitter, Spotify, and Audible. I've been trying to listen to more books recently. Um, so that's one that I've been using more, but I mean, uh, Twitter pretty heavy, just that's kind of where I get information. So that's kind of where probably it's the most addicting or most used. Excellent, well said. And as you've noticed, um, everyone was muted upon entry, but then you have the power to unmute yourselves. And we will definitely be talking about the power of the mute uh, later on in the meeting. So um, Hannah H, if you uh, have a, an app in mind, what have you got for us? I would say probably Instagram, just like posting my work accounts from that. And my dog has an Instagram. <laughs> and then also like, I feel like a lot of people have been posting really good recipes on Instagram. So I've been getting like my food inspiration from that. Absolutely. If you have a recipe link, go ahead and post that in the chat. I, I definitely know we have some, some chefs on, on here. So um, we would love to see that from you. Sophia. I'm going to have to go with probably like Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I've definitely been listening to podca podcasts more frequently, just like in walking around to try to decompress from the day. So that's been really helpful. Very true. Vivian? Um, I don't use my phone, a lot, but I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing. <laughs> Perfect. That's impressive to not use your phone a lot. You're right. I might need some tips from you. Uh, <laughs> time. I don't have any social media, so that's how I do it. <laughs> that's probably really good right now. <laughs> uh, Michelle Galambos. I would say Apple Podcasts also, but also Peloton. I did not buy a Peloton bike, but I've been using the Peloton app, and I love getting the little badges and like completing all the different things. So I'm on Peloton all the time and they have amazing meditation, um, audios and walking and all types of stuff. So I've been using the Peloton app a ton. That's impressive. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Ariel. Um, I would have to say, like it's between two, my Gmail app or um, map my run. I don't actually run, but I go walking five to seven mornings a week at like 6 a.m. So I like to track how far I go. 
Nice. Those are very good. Yeah. If people have, as people are saying these, if you're uh, okay with posting them in the chat, I'm sure people would love to love to latch on to this and we can learn from each other. Carly. So I was thinking about this because like minor, yeah, probably social media, but also um, <laughs> I use Microsoft Teams a lot <laughs> and I love it's. I think it's a, so much better than Skype for business because Microsoft Teams has GIFs, which are just amazing. Um, but I also use Spotify a lot for my podcasts and I listen to like sleep music before I go to bed and my phone has like learned my habits. So like if I haven't turned the Spotify like sleep music on yet, it's like suggestion, set a timer for 40 minutes because that's what I, what I do. So it's really my phone knows my every move. So I'd say Spotify for non-work related things and Microsoft Teams for work related things. Those are both excellent advice. We need both of that. Very true. Uh, Laura Andrews. I think uh, one of my most used is probably my calendar app because what day is it even? I don't know anymore. <laughs> Um, but one that a new one that I've started using is the fit on app. Um, and like, who was it that said, was it Michelle? Like with the badges, it's really compelling to get those badges and know that I worked out once this month. So that's better than last month. <laughs> we, we do love our badges, our lists, our calendars, all of that. Uh, speaking of people who love those things, Mary, do you have a good app for us? Um, well, nothing that no one has already said. Uh, definitely Instagram for me has been pretty addicting, uh, but I have been uh, doing uh, more Apple podcasts and then um, just finding some music inspiration on iTunes. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Marisol, do you have apps on your phone? Good one, Kelly. Actually, yeah, group me, of course. Kelly, that's Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> Uh, our office utilizes GroupMe to communicate with each other, which has been, if we didn't think we use it a lot already, uh, we've definitely used it more during this remote time. So it helps us stay connected. Very true. Um, is it Tana or Tana? Yes, it's Tana. And, awesome. and um, yeah, I, I, as I wrote, Instagram has consistently been one of my weaker ones. I love I love various accounts on there and um but I have loved Calm too, meditation mm. app with Calm. I, I've been yeah, leaning on that and actually saying that gets me back on the wagon after a week of vacation where I didn't use it, but so Calm is a good one. Insight timer too. Oh, those are both excellent. Mm -hmm. Alyssa. Um hi. So I would say that um, the one I love the most right now is the, the, I have an iPhone that has just like a podcast app. Um, and I listen to crime junkie. Um, and it is like, strangely, it's like what I like to listen to before I go to bed at night. It like, um, you know, it, it, it helps me fall asleep. Um, and it, but it's very interesting. It's just crimes and these two women talking about them and murders and, um, so it's a great podcast if, if, if you're into that sort of stuff. Um, hopefully not into murders, but like detective <laughs> stuff. So check it out. I should, I need to keep my neutral role as the facilitator. I was, I'm, I'm, I'm being too expressive here. So, yeah. But. Oh no, that's, I, I, I love making people laugh. So that's part of my goal when I share. <laughs> so if you weren't laughing, I'd be like, stop taking me too seriously. <laughs> Very true. Uh, Amelia. Hi, Kelly. Hello. Um, so two, uh, Bloom for meditation, because I'm mm. learning to do that and trying to teach my five-year-old to do that, um, especially during this time. And then Amazon. I love putting all the things in the cart, but then <laughs> not, like saving them for later, <laughs> never going through with the purchase, but just adding them all into my cart. So it's been therapeutic for me. Those are, that's very true. Um, Patty. Is 
So Patty, what I'm going to ask you to do is unmute yourself because I know we automatically muted you, but you have the power. I'm sorry. To I've yes. been muting myself and unmuting myself because my dog has been um, barking and wanting to go out. So I've been trying to keep say, spare you all from that. I would have to say um, radio.com because I'm a sports fanatic. And so I like to listen to the sports talk shows especially from Philadelphia. And there goes my dog. Um, and then, well, I'll just stop there uh, so you don't have to listen to my dog. Well, we love a good sports fanatic. And actually, thank you for modeling one of the behaviors I'm going to be addressing later. So that worked out very well. Uh, Michelle S. Um, so kind of like Calm, I've been using an app called Headspace, yes. and it's nice because they have meditations for any time of day, anything that you're looking for, so I've really been liking that. That's a great one. And Jarlene, am I saying your name right? Yes. Um, at first it was, okay, don't judge me, but TikTok was really fun at first, then I got over it. <laughs> And now it's pretty much Pinterest. Um, I like to look up recipes or if I want to do crafts with the kids. And then I'm renovating my house. So I get a lot of ideas from Pinterest. Oh, excellent. No, no, I can tell you there's no judgment here for, for following a TikTok, I promise. Um, and did I miss anybody? I want to make sure I caught everybody coming in. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for sharing those. Um, as you can see, so for an icebreaker, these are already, I feel like I know everybody a little bit better. Um, it's a great way to do really quick, casual introductions. It's especially useful to use an icebreaker as a facilitator when not everybody knows each other, uh, when you need to foster connection, especially in certain meetings. Um, or maybe you've had a recurring meeting that's kind of running dry and you want to insert something new. And it's definitely good to have in your back pocket if you sense disengagement or need a, a good pick me up. So as you can see, um, you can have your icebreaker be anything that you want. In our case, uh, it was completely fun and off topic, but we still learn something from each other. Uh, these types of questions can be relatively quick and innocuous for everyone to answer. And uh, so then you as the facilitator get to decide how you want people to respond to that icebreaker. If you want to put people in breakout rooms and get them to in small groups and have them get to know each other. If you want to call on people like I did uh, or have a popcorn style and have people call on other people. Um, but it is your role as a facilitator to uh, introduce that. All right, so moving on to our next slide, um, we've got some community agreements and uh, I put these uh, on the slide. They are also at the very top of our Zoom group chat for people to refer to. And these are just some basic examples that I've shared, uh, respect, open-mindedness, engagement, attentive listening, awareness of time, support the purpose, um, you feel free to come up with your own as the facilitator or work with the group that you're meeting with to come up with community agreements that are going to best fit your participant culture and meeting style. Uh, I put Zoom agreements on here because we are in the Zoom world now. So uh, specifically with Zoom, be thinking about what does the meeting call for, but also what are you comfortable with as the facilitator? So for example, you can see we've been using the chat a lot, which um, I'm a huge fan of and I keep referring to. Um, if, if you are comfortable using the chat and you, and you go ahead and monitor it yourself, uh, if you wanna have someone else monitor it, you can delegate that as the facilitator. You can also choose to not use it or there's a feature in Zoom where you can disable it entirely. So, if you do decide to use the chat feature, uh, make sure that your participants know that upfront and make sure that they know how it will be used and then follow through with that. 
Um, there are a lot of people, as you can tell, that are comfortable using the chat feature, and it's uh, a little bit painful when people are chatting, but then they don't feel like something gets addressed. So they feel like they're participating and they want their voice to be heard, but um, the chat is not a way to participate, an established way to participate in the meeting. So make sure as a facilitator that's something that you are uh, communicating and controlling. Something else with the chat feature is to think about it in the same way that you that would make the most sense in an in-person meeting. So similarly how in meetings we might um, use the whiteboard or the, the screen to write down resources or people would ask questions and you could put those on your agenda. Those are great things to place in the chat like we've done here. Um, However, in an in-person meeting, sidebar conversations uh, can be really distracting and the chat feature functions much in the same way. So for our purposes, the chat feature is enabled for people to ask questions, to share resources, uh, or to comment on something that has been said. I will monitor the chat feature periodically. Um, and if it does get really busy and, and everyone's clamoring, uh, all at once, I'll stop every 10 to 15 minutes to address what is in the chat. So uh, take heart that if what you have asked or shared is not addressed immediately, I promise I will get to it. Couple other things on Zoom agreements. Um, the Q&A functions very much the same way that the chat does. We do not have the Q&A feature in here. It is uh, something that you can set up on Zoom and it's used for much larger groups to track question and answer situations specifically. So it might be great if, uh, again, you're running a much larger meeting or a larger classroom environment. Reactions, so. We have noticed that Zoom is really behind in the emoji game. Uh, all you get are clapping hands and thumbs up. And so that means that, lucky for you as a facilitator, Zoom has made it so that you can only receive positive feedback, which I love. Um, and so reactions are a great way for, um, to invite participants to show their engagement without interrupting the flow of the meeting. So letting people know that they can use these reactions. And for those of you um, who haven't used these before, they're gonna be at the bottom of right hand of your screen with the little smiley plus face that says reactions on it. And then you can click that and then just add a little clap or a little thumbs up. Yes, I love it, appreciate it. Um, and that is a great way to invite uh, participation that's nonverbal. And I mean, just like we do in, Person, you can allow other nonverbal cues uh, for people to show that they're listening, like head nods and head shakes. Um, I have also done jazz hands in meetings before. If something's really resonating with you, you can ask people to, to express that in some way physically. Um, these are great ways to elicit responses and engagement, even when everyone is muted, as you can say. Speaking of being muted, uh, this was the number one feedback I received when I sent out an email to everyone participating today. If you signed up before Thursday, uh, I was able to reach out and say, hey, what are some bothersome behaviors? And this was the one. Um, so usually not a problem in person, right? But uh, in Zoom, this is a big deal. So as the facilitator, it is your role to establish this expectation uh, to please mute yourselves when you are not talking. And you can actually set up the feature in Zoom to automatically mute participants upon entry, which is how we did it for, for everyone here. Um, but then you have the power to mute and unmute yourself. Uh, you can also have the power as the host to be the only one to unmute people. Uh, but that might backfire on your engagement piece a little bit. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, the muting piece is really helpful for groups of five or more. And uh, with, just because there's so much noise and there's so many people who, who could be talking with four or less, especially in a more conversational or a casual meeting, 
that's up for all of you to decide. So um, actually, as Patty modeled, if you have your own background noise, you know, just if your washing machine's going, your dog's barking, your children are fighting, there's construction, um, whatever it is, gauge your own background noise and go ahead and decide if in those smaller groups if muting yourself is appropriate. So as the facilitator, where this matters is, it is your role to set this expectation of, of the power of the mute um, and then remind people as needed. Uh, I promise you everyone does appreciate this. So ways to do this are um, simply by addressing the person directly. Uh, sometimes if there's a conversation going, that's not quite possible. So uh, in which case you can put the mute request in the chat uh, or in and just say, hey, so-and-so, like reminder to mute yourself. Um, or if you have their contact info, you can reach out to them directly, perhaps if the chat is disabled or people aren't paying attention. Uh, somebody actually did this to me uh, and because I was accidentally unmuted and it was really embarrassing, but I really appreciated it. Uh, same thing with video and audio, so making sure that everything is working on your end. Uh, the same way that you would set up an in-person space, setting up an e-space. And so, for example, Tom and I arrived uh, to this meeting 15 minutes early to make sure everything was working. We troubleshooted some things really quickly. And, uh, of course, it's always helpful to be the first person to arrive at your own meetings. We know that's not always possible, but it is ideal. And um, one of the things that you noticed as you were coming into this meeting was um, the use of the waiting room. And this is actually something, uh, if you work with students, our staff has found especially helpful um, because it helps uh, control the flow of the start of the meeting. And it also guards against any accidental drop-ins or Zoom bombers. Um, and I'm going through a lot of these different features. So if these are features that you have questions about how to do, um, or want to practice using them, you are welcome to stay on after this meeting is over, or you can reach out to me directly. My contact information is on the agenda, and uh, we can absolutely talk through this. Uh, one more thing about video and audio is uh, encouraging people to have both their video and audio on, um, and then letting them know ahead of time so that this is something that people can prepare for. Um, because they may not, it may not be something that they do all the time. Um, we definitely recognize that this is not possible for everyone. So especially if it's a recurring meeting, this is an, an important expectation to set to uh, gauge participant engagement. Uh, this is something that uh, my staff has done that's actually been really helpful. In the beginning of, of Zoom meetings, there were all these different expectations of, of how to participate and it was really helpful for our leadership to establish and say, okay, at these meetings, everyone needs to have their video and audio on. And at these meetings, it doesn't matter so much. So that, that you could really gauge your level of um, involvement and participation. And again, the video definitely helps maximize participant engagement because we can see each other, um, we can use hand signals, we can have eye contact and all of those nonverbal cues that help with engagement. And that helps you achieve your goal for the meeting. So definitely reminding people like, you're not keeping video on to micromanage them. It's again, to help increase participant engagement. And then with these agreements, just make sure they're posted somewhere. Uh, so like I said, ours are posted in the chat feature and we'll get to why in a little bit. Before moving on to the role of the facilitator, does anybody have questions? Awesome, okay, here's the good stuff. So the role of the facilitator, and then Tom, we can go to the next one. There's nothing hidden, perfect. Yes, my lovely Nutella jar. So, making sure for you as the facilitator that you know what your role is. So in each meeting with a different purpose, we might have a different role. So you might uh, have a commander type of role as a facilitator in one meeting where you just need to run the meeting. You might be a collaborator and be there to be a part of the team and come to a solution or have a discussion together. 
Uh, or perhaps your role is to be invisible and there is a lot of value in you being neutral and just helping facilitate the meeting as it goes along without sharing any particular um, side or opinion. So being able to establish that and then design and deliver structure for effective meetings. So for example, setting the parameters like um, the icebreaker and the community agreements and distributing the agenda. Keeping the conversation on track, uh, which we'll also get to in a little bit. Making everyone feel heard. So um, like we said, uh, assessing or addressing all the different ways that people can participate and share their voice in this meeting. Synthesize and organize ideas quickly and be neutral if it calls for that, but mostly flexible, adaptable, and confident. And so, and we'll get to some of these um, in more practical ways for how to do that. Okay, so the meeting elements. The first thing within the meeting is we all know, since we're in higher ed, that there are meetings for meetings. And uh, so within the, before the meeting even happens, we have the pre-meeting. And so thinking about for you as the facilitator, again, to know what your role is, to identify the purpose of the meeting, to identify the participants and their roles. So in some one-off meetings or any specialized situations, you're, you might need to reach out to particular stakeholders or invite certain people. Um, and some of them may have established roles that you, that you want to set as well. Develop the agendas, and I pluralize this in some cases because there is the participant agenda uh, that you all have, um, and then you as the facilitator should have the facilitator agenda, which is going to be the bones of the participant agenda, but is going to have a lot more information within it. Um, I have my own agenda that's helping me with all my little bullet points and keeping content and keeping track of things. So it helps to have two agendas in that case. Gathering any background materials you might need. So any videos, resources, um, that sort of thing, setting up the space like we talked about, whether it's physical uh, or tech wise, and then sending the agenda uh, if you can ahead of time, just so people know what to expect. Does anybody have questions so far about the pre-meeting? Awesome, yeah, and just, so just remember your role as the facilitator, you know, it's not just the meeting, it's leading up to the meeting, and we'll also get to the, the post-meeting bits as well. All right, so the meeting itself, awesome. As you've noticed, we have been modeling some of these behaviors. So within this workshop, I've wanted to model the pre-meeting behaviors and the meeting behaviors and the post-meeting behaviors. So we have done introductions of some sort, and we've established a purpose, and we may have had an icebreaker. In our case, that was helpful. Community agreements, which we went over, those are something that would be established either at the onset of a recurring meeting, or maybe, again, if you just have like a one-time meeting, um, or in recurring meetings where you anticipate tricky conversations, personalities, um, this definitely probably comes in helpful with reentry conversations or um, health HR related conversations where you might be meeting with all the same people, but sometimes it's important to just establish some ground rules for having some of those discussions. The content piece. So thinking about when you're developing your agenda, uh, I put, you know, you're going to have all of your items on there, but um, you can add some of these if you would like as a facilitator, if that helps you control the meeting a little bit better. So, for example, adding the who to some of the content, if you have particular people that you would like to speak to that, you can have their names there so that they are prepared to talk about that. That's something that our staff does that I really appreciate. Um, and it's also a great way to ensure that in your meeting that multiple people are talking. The time piece is useful. If you would like, uh, you'll notice that I don't have this on my agenda, but you can add in for each topic a little parentheses of like uh, five minutes for this or 10 minutes for this. And 
I highly recommend this if time is something you feel that you or your group will struggle with, uh, where you can set time blocks on the agenda and then publish the beginning and then as the facilitator, hold people to them. So as a facilitator, like we said, there's a bit of control in the meeting, but also being flexible so that if a topic continues a little bit longer than you intended, but maybe it needs to, that you allow it to do so. Um, but that also you're in control so that if something really goes down uh, the rabbit hole, which is really easy to do during these times, uh, that you are able to uh, establish control and stay on topic. And we'll touch on strategies for how to do that. And then moving on to um, e-meeting best practices. So Tom, go ahead and let's move forward here. Perfect. And this is really important to share right now. Again, this was feedback that I got from a lot of you of like, okay, we're great at doing meetings in person, but there's, what are some things that can make this a little bit easier? So um, these are not things that you have to do, but they do help the meeting run a little bit more smoothly. And, and I'll explain uh, certain situations. So having people identify themselves when speaking. So you'll notice that I, when people were talking, I, I shared you by name and uh, I apologize if that was not, if your Zoom name is not your name. So uh, that is definitely something to be mindful of that I did not share at the beginning. Um, but when other people are speaking, so if anyone has something to say, then um, just, identifying yourself and it's as simple as like when it's time for your feedback and then you say this is kelly speaking i had a question about blah 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 and this is very helpful when not everyone is using video uh, or you have a big group like this and you can't see everyone on the screen so it's just nice to again be able to put context to that repeat back for understanding has been a go-to theme for our staff uh, and it might be either you as the facilitator are repeating back to a participant to make sure that you understood them correctly, um, or maybe someone else is hearing you say something and you ask them to repeat it back to ensure understanding. Uh, it's really easy to get uh, wires crossed in, during these times, and so being able to immediately check for understanding and then address that and say, yes, that's correct, or uh, actually no, I meant this, it's great to be able to do that uh, immediately. Use your participant list. So I have my participant list here. Um, this is really helpful to make note when people are speaking. So again, if you as the facilitator are trying to maximize engagement, you can keep track of who's talking. Um, it helps you maybe reach out to people who haven't spoken. It also helps you just keep track of everybody in the meeting when you can't see them all at once. Setting the scene, there are a lot of tutorials out there. We will not spend time going over them, but I will absolutely share these with you after the meeting is over as part of my resources. But these are just important things to consider. Once again, establishing the use of chat and reactions as we have done in this meeting. Um, being mindful of screen share. So sometimes as a facilitator, if you are sharing your screen, maybe some email pop-ups that might be happening or anything like that that might be distracting to people who are viewing your screen. And you can ask other people to do the same. A little thing, but definitely has uh, made a difference in the past. And then lastly, uh, platform fatigue is real, people. We all know. Um, and my boyfriend told me that instead of Leslie Nope here on the screen, I basically could have shared pictures of myself on day day one and, and day 14, uh, except for today, except for today, but other than that. Um, and so definitely honor this as a facilitator. Uh, and the way to do this is just respecting the allotted time giving grace to the context of people's days. So if you start seeing yourself, and I'm sure we all have been there, where you're in multiple Zoom meetings with multiple people, um, maybe discuss if there are other ways to go about having some of these meetings, such as skipping a week or um, having a shorter time block or maybe a different day and time every once in a while, just to give yourselves a break, but ultimately to maximize participation. 
All right, and facilitation strategies. And before we move on to that, does anybody have questions about uh, e-meeting best practices or meeting content? Awesome. All right, facilitation strategies. So first of all, this is not a real pie chart, so don't worry about dissecting that. That is not scientific, it's just fun. Um, but I wanted to touch on them for this group because a lot of you were asking about um, how to maximize engagement, and especially when we're online, especially when people are muted, uh, what does that look like? And so these top three things in bold are great for maximizing uh, participant engagement. Breakout groups, especially if you are an instructor, if you are working with a large classroom, a large group of students, a large group of staff, definitely use breakouts to your advantage. We all know that we are comfortable talking in small, more comfortable, I should say, talking in small groups to other people as opposed to being the one person talking at everybody. And so breakout groups, uh, just in their nature of being small, small groups of three or four or maybe pairs will help facilitate that conversation. Um, active listening and just as a facilitator, modeling that behavior that you want to see other people doing, right? So using the reactions, using the chat, um, using any hand signals, eye contact, head nods, all of that will help show that that's the type of uh, communication that you want to have in your group. And then when you're doing that for other people, it gives them an environment where their voice feels heard. And then the other piece is the space and time for feedback. And so just sharing with people how you want them to give you feedback. Do you want them to chime in at any point? If so, how? Um, if you are gonna set aside time after each topic, similar to how we've done so far, of having pauses every once in a while to kind of check for understanding, um, or maybe it's at the end and you just have a set a few minutes to, to check in with everybody before you break. Um, whatever it is, just make sure that you let people know. And you, if you think that you as a facilitator might forget to do this, I, I put it in my agenda. You don't have to put it in the participant agenda. You can put it in your facilitator agenda and literally tell yourself, take a break, pull the audience, ask a question, one, one minute pause, whatever it is, um, to, to help make sure that you provide that space and time for feedback. And then below that, again, are other strategies, obviously as a facilitator, asking questions, um, paraphrasing, summarizing, or mirroring, any terminology that's going to show uh, that you are hearing and understanding people boomeranging and redirecting, meaning that you as the facilitator don't need to respond. Again, you can control the meeting, not necessarily by providing the answer, but maybe reaching back out uh, to the participants and asking for their feedback. Restating the purpose if off topic, and um, we'll get to that in a little bit. And then the parking or any terminology that you prefer, this is where you put things that are off topic, but you still want to acknowledge that people have been heard. So things that get brought up in meetings that um, are useful to maybe come back to at some point if you have time or at another time that you still want to acknowledge that people have said, but don't have space in this meeting. Um, they can be jotted down in your own agenda. You can put them in the chat. Um, you can, if you're in person, write them on the whiteboard or in the screen. Um, and again, it's a great way for people to feel heard, even if something is not um, on that topic item. And then note taking and taking breaks, those are um, also optional. Sometimes your meeting might call for note taking, especially if it's a brainstorming activity or a discussion. That is a great role as a facilitator that you can play. And that would be a totally separate session that we would do is how to be a good note taker. Um, and then taking breaks, like depending on how long some of your meetings are, sometimes all we need to refresh ourselves and to uh, increase our participation is just to take a step back from the screen and to refresh and then revisit it again. So if you find your meeting going longer than it was meant to, um, or you feel that you're at a particularly uh, like dry time with your group, uh, definitely feel free to use the power of the break uh, to, 
to give people a minute and then get back together to maximize engagement. Okay, this again tends to be somebody's fa everybody's favorite challenging behaviors. And I thank all of you for sharing uh, what you did with me. And I had a lot of fun finding all my pictures for this. Um, so these are just a few challenging behaviors that we all have done, we all have experienced. Um, and so I wanted to make sure to share them and then also share some general ways of approaching them. So as you can see, there's monopolizing the conversation, going off topic or spiraling, um, attacking others and spreading negativity, which is denoted with a cute little heart that's sad and a stop sign. Um, and not engaging and being stubborn or inflexible and not on board, something like that with my cute little mule. That's a cute inflexible mule. So looking at ways to address some of these challenging behaviors on the next slide, um, something to remember as a facilitator is sometimes we don't even realize what we're doing. So as a facilitator, it is completely appropriate and within your scope to remind people of uh, what they're doing by just referring back to the agreements. So if you find someone's doing something like this, go back to the community agreements and just give them a little nudge. Um, the agreements should be visible somewhere. So again, if the meeting is in person, you're, you're pointing back to a whiteboard or something on the wall. They could even be on the agenda itself. In this case, they're in our chat feature for easy reference. Um, sometimes we may not feel comfortable addressing something verbally in the middle of a meeting. So um, absolutely, it's within your purview as the facilitator to approach the individual separately. So if it doesn't need to be done immediately, you can do this outside of the meeting um, and follow up with them separately. If it does need to be addressed immediately, again, you can stop the conversation. You have that power as the facilitator, refer back to the community agreements, you can also send this person um, a private message um, and, and just address it that way. Uh, the going off topic was the one I heard about the most. And so, uh, and again, in times like this of uncertainty and lots of confusion that uh, it's very easy to spiral. So this is a great way to exercise your flexibility and your control as a facilitator. When you start to notice something going off topic, Again, you you're the one that's responsible for making sure that the goal is achieved, that people's voices are heard, and that you honor people's time. So when you start to see something going off topic, you are welcome to ask the group how they would like to proceed. Take a poll to see if people want to keep talking about this subject or come back to it at another time and provide that opportunity. Um, if you anticipate any of these things happening, so in the sense of framing the conversation or um, setting up the optimal environment, this is a way for you to, let me see here. Setting up the optimal environment. Um, this is a way for you as the facilitator to set up the parameters of the meeting. For a lot of us, we, know the people in our meeting, we can anticipate that um, some of these behaviors might happen. So we can help frame the conversation for that meeting. So think about how you can facilitate that meeting outside of the meeting itself. So for example, um, if you anticipate potentially um, a lack of engagement or inflexibility, instead of leaving conversations open-ended, you can make it a point to call on people um, or ask for people to respond in some sort of way. Uh, you, again, you can use the breakout features to, to foster more of that small group environment. For anybody that um, maybe needs a longer time processing or you anticipate might not be on board with what you're going to be talking about, See if you can get a meeting with them one-on-one -on -one before the meeting to discuss this um, or close after uh, the meeting has happened so that that individual's questions and feelings can be addressed. 
Um, and I did want to go back to the off topic piece and a couple of ways to address that. I'm sorry I skipped over that. Um, so when again, when someone's getting off topic, like we said, your role as the facilitator is to make sure that the goal of the meeting is achieved, that everyone's voices are heard, and that you keep time. So again, you can let you can pull the group to see if they'd rather keep talking, get to items later, like I said. And something to say also is, okay, wow, this is definitely something that we are passionate about. I would love to continue talking about this. I will look into setting up a separate meeting just for this in the near future. Or if it's a recurring meeting, maybe you can include this topic on the next agenda and then make sure that you as the facilitator are following through with that. So just some different ways for you as the facilitator to recognize that these, um, these behaviors will take place, but it is absolutely within your role to address them. And you can do that in a variety of ways. Um, does anybody have other challenging behaviors that they want to ask about uh, or strategies that they have found to be helpful in these cases? Kelly, I might, um, I might jump in here for one second. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, a resource that was shared with me last year um, and I will, uh, it's, it's in a Word doc file which I'll share to everyone through the chat function. It's a list of destructive group behaviors and a list of constructive group behaviors. And um, what I've done is worked with groups and had, um, everyone has to identify their own dominant destructive group behavior and their own dominant constructive group behavior so that there could be some um, group accountability as well. So people can say, hey, you're the one who's always getting us off topic, so let's get back on topic. Um, and it becomes public then and not kind of shares the load from the facility if it's a if it's a recurring meeting of a group that's happening over and over again. So I'll share that real quick. I would love that, Tom. Thank you for I love that idea and, and that activity. So thank you for that. Yes, please do share. Um, Callie, this is Marie Soul. I have a question. How do you yeah. with a Zoom meeting, if you're like asking, for example, right now you ask the group and everyone's on mute so one of two things can happen everyone still stays on mute um how long should you give until you move on if someone doesn't jump in and then um the opposite can happen where multiple people unmute themselves at the same time so how do you do you have any strategies for how to manage either or both of those situations oh great questions um definitely for how long you should let that gap go it really depends on how much time you have right um i think i mean i know you've done this before like counting to 10 um silently is completely fine um you can say we're gonna i'm gonna give everybody a minute to think about it and then check back in if you have the time to do that um the other thing you can do is say that give that little pause if you would like and then say okay we're going to move on but if you if you come up with something then absolutely feel free to add it in the chat or if you want if you're okay with people chiming in uh, verbally later that is completely fine as well oh that's true too so laura was saying that she took a webinar and every time they said does anyone have any questions people had to put no so that they didn't wait too long um, which is great if you have, depending on how your group size, um, but definitely very helpful for a lot of us that have uh, smaller groups than 10. And thank you, Tom, for posting the constructive and destructive behaviors. And then when everyone wants to chime in all at once, that's, that's always really nice. Um, so you as the facilitator, you have the, the uh, option to help control that the same way you would in an in-person meeting. Um, it's a little bit trickier on Zoom because we can't see that as much as we can in person. Um, so being mindful of if people are unmuting, which I know that, that you are, especially if it's on video, that makes it a little bit easier. Um, but you can also have people, if you anticipate that there's a lot of people in a meeting, or that a lot of people might want to talk at once, you can have people put their name in the chat and then that way you can call on people in that order. 
Um, you can have them use the raise the hand feature, which we don't have in our Zoom chat right now, but that is a feature that you have in Zoom. Um, or um, to kind of share in a way, in that sort of way, like they can unmute themselves like we have done. And then you just know if you're looking at video, then you know that everybody that's unmuted is somebody that wants to speak. Perfect, thank you. So as we wrap up here in our last five minutes, I wanna be a good facilitator and make sure that um, that we end on time and also give you tips for how to wrap up your own meetings. So keeping in mind that as you wrap up, the power of revisiting the purpose will determine your next steps. So everybody being able to look at your agenda or wherever the purpose is posted and say, did was our goal achieved? Um, if yes, what are our next steps? If no, do we have a follow-up meeting? What are our next steps? So our purpose is to empower everyone with strategies and resources, resources forthcoming, to be prepared, confident, and adaptable as a facilitator. And then based on whether or not that purpose was achieved, you as the facilitator get to establish what those next steps are and make those clear for everybody in the meeting. There may be action items um, that might include an additional meeting, they might include delegating certain activities to people, but it's really important to share this at the end of the meeting because there's a lot that happens, uh, whether your meeting is 15 minutes, an hour, or two hours. It's really good to recap what those items are. So again, revisiting, did we complete our purpose? What are the next steps or what are our action items? Where do we go from here? And then as a facilitator, um, Likely this will not be your only time doing this, so make sure that you have the appropriate follow-up or debrief or garner the feedback that you need. If it's a one-time meeting or a large group, you can do this in the form of assessments, surveys. Um, if you're in small groups, you can just follow up with staff individually or send out emails, um, have conversations that way. If you want to figure out how what the next best step is for you as a facilitator moving forward. And then absolutely following up with resources. So that's something that I will do. I did not come up with this material on my own. It is a synthesis of a lot of best practices. And so I wanna make sure to provide you with that so that you have some very practical and tangible uh, strategies and resources to continue uh, your facilitator education. And finally, uh, on the last slide, we will end with takeaways or questions. So um, we only have a couple of minutes left uh, and I would like normally, in, in, if time allowed, it would be great for everyone to go around and share if they had one thing that they were taking away from this meeting or one action item for themselves or a question that they still had. In the interest of time, um, I'll ask for anybody to share if you feel comfortable speaking in front of the group. If you would like to share in the chat or uh, verbally if you have a takeaway or a question that still remains. And I'll have, uh, we'll do that for the next two minutes. This is Patty. Hi, do Patty. you have a list of other icebreaker questions? I don't personally have a list, but I can send you plenty of places that do. Thank you. Or refer you to Aaron Davis. I can definitely, he'll probably have some as well. But yes, I will include that in my list of resources. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Kelly, I just thought of something, um, the chat function. What happens when, when the meeting ends? Like all these good takeaways, where do they go at the end of the meeting? Oh, great question. Uh, Tom, uh, if you are here, I will let you speak to that. Are you here? Can you enlighten us on the, the chat? The takeaways? Um, what, where does this chat go? Ah. So everything that everyone's sharing here. So um, the chat, um, <laughs> so whoever owns the meeting on Zoom gets a transcript of the chat. 
So anything that's that's put in the chat would be documented automatically, and you just have to make sure that the meeting facilitator um, is aware of it and, and keeps it. Uh, here is a very important life lesson for anyone who has not learned it yet. If you send a private message to someone else in a Zoom meeting, that private message also goes into the transcript that goes to the meeting owner. So if you're going to have a side conversation, keep it appropriate because other people are going to be able to see it. <laughs> Fun fact. Um, and lastly, thank you, Tom, for sharing that. And uh, Marisol, for anybody who wants to keep this chat for themselves, the uh, three dots in the bottom right hand corner of the chat feature, when you click those, you can save the chat so that you can have this material. And I will include um, the resources that people shared in our list of resources I will send out. It is now 2.01. Um, so thank you everyone for, for staying on. I will stay on for a few more minutes if people have particular questions like to ask me, um, feel free to stay on. Also, if you wanna reach out to me directly and discuss any particular situations that I did not address, I would absolutely love to talk with you further. So. Have a wonderful, great to meet all of you and can't wait to try out some of these new apps. And thank you so much, Kelly, for spending an hour with us and sharing your expertise. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Hi, Kelly. It's Ariel. Hello. Yes, hi. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for staying on. I have a question for you. Totally. Um, how, like, what, what do you think about incorporating an icebreaker or something in the middle of meetings to take a break or rejuvenate your team? Like, are there good short ones? Because um, obviously you don't want to, like, take 15, 20 minutes. Absolutely. Like, are there strategies with that? Great question. How big is your group? Are you, like, what do you have in mind? Um, I work with orientation leaders. Um, so <laughs> there's like 30 of them. <laughs> so a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's 31 of them. Um, but I also just do a lot of different um, work. I'm a graduate student worker at Montclair State University in Northern New Jersey. Wow. So wow. Also, thank you for letting me join in. Um, I yeah. know and Sellison pulled some strings so I can be a part of this for my practicum. Um, oh, that's awesome. Good. But I would say absolutely it is appropriate to do that in the in the meeting, like especially if you're noticing uh, lack, if you have the time, first of all, right? But if you're noticing lack of engagement or just things getting a little bit stale, um, just to switch up the environment in some way. Like, so this is the same way we do in person where it's like, okay, everybody just like turn to your neighbor or stand up and stretch or something like that, where we just need a minute to reset. Um, and also to, you know, make sure that people are feeling engaged. So online, right? Like it's really easy to tune things out or to be like listening from afar. But if people think that they're going to be called on or they have to say something, they're more likely to share that energy. So yeah. Definitely feel free to do uh, to do the icebreakers or if they fit in kind of like on topic in a way that matches what you're talking about, it's a good transition. So if you find something where you're moving on to a new topic in your meeting or workshop that before you do that, that there's like an activity that you can do to help um, pivot towards that, I guess. So whether it's, yeah. you can put people in breakout rooms for like five minutes, uh, if there's something that you want them to discuss, uh, whether it's pertaining to the topic or not, I think that that's, again, it just keeps people on their toes. And it's a great way for people to hear other voices, including their own, rather than just like that one environment and, um, and, that, one, and that one voice. So that's what about um, whether it's like with orientation leaders or just other staff members? Because I kind of have in my position, my hands are dipped in a lot of different, or whatever that's saying is, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, but because sometimes it's really helpful to just like step away. Um, I used to teach ESL to adults and 
I taught a four hour class. And so I implemented a lot of breaks. Yeah, I don't know why I worked for a nonprofit and that's how they set it up. It was just a straight four hour session and you'd go like right through lunchtime. So everyone would bring snacks and you had to take breaks. And when I was with them, um, first of all, I only had a class of like 15 students, but when we would take breaks, I could literally go back to like the women's restroom and it was an all woman class. And I'd be like, all right, like, stop dilly dallying like we need to go back to class but if you let someone step away from their computer screen you can't like reach through the screen and, <laughs> and grab them back in so how do you make sure people come back to the meeting if you wanted to let them step away and actually take a break that wasn't still on zoom right good question um uh tom do you have some thought i mean you do this a lot um yeah, you know, the thing on, on Zoom is, um, one, is I need to always check my assumptions because if I see that somebody has stepped away from their computer in a Zoom meeting, because I tend to the cynical, my, my first assumption is they're disengaged. So first I have to check my assumption because they could be just engaged, but they're getting laundry out of the dryer or, you know, like, Sometimes my cat decides to puke in the middle of the meeting and they're <laughs> like, I, I go clean it up, right? So just because they're not in front of their camera doesn't mean that they're not engaged in what's happening. Um, but I think there's a lot of ways, especially when we're talking about student workers or, or um, student volunteers, I'm not sure if they're employees, but um, they are. there's ways to do, to do check-ins in a meeting. Um, and, as, and if that expectation is set from the beginning, um, that they know that, when the meeting is happening that there may be regular check-ins, it just has, it tends to create more engagement because they know there's, there's always a chance for them to be asked to actually engage. That's a good idea to think about that. Yeah. Thanks. I yeah, mean, and the other thing I would say is that for those middle of the meeting icebreakers, um, I'm like annoyingly obsessed with outcomes, like, establishing outcomes from the beginning. And so if you're thinking about that thing in the middle, um, an icebreaker is to get people to get to know each other. In my mind, that thing in the middle is not an icebreaker, it's an energizer, right? And so- That's what I'm, that, I use the word ice. Yeah. But that's what I was referring to. That's what to. you want, right? You want to like get them alive again. And that doesn't require that everybody interacts with everyone. So those breakout rooms, um, those small discussions are really powerful for that because you just it's it's the same thing as like getting them to stand up in the middle of uh training and like shake it off right or we do some like weird thing to get them moving it's the same thing you just want to like switch their attention really quickly before you bring it back yeah team pedia well, i think should have some of those as well yeah thank you yeah. i appreciate your um feedback and answering my questions but I really enjoyed this. I learned a lot from it. Uh, one of my coworkers was like, how, how do you get to go to this? And I was like, because I'm.